Welcome to Skyline Entourage Offsite, a podcast where we explore everything events, experience, and marketing. For more than 20 years, Skyline Entourage has been designing custom exhibits and working with companies to produce their events worldwide. Join us as we discuss new ideas and chat with industry experts to bring you the latest. My name is Dominic. I have Carla here, my colleague and marketing extraordinaire. We're part of Skyline. Skyline is mainly focused in trade shows. So that's mainly our focus in the industry. Now, obviously, with the situation right now, that industry is sort of at a halt. So Carla thought of putting a little podcast together to keep informing people and keep connecting with our audience. And then uh, we reached out to different sphere of the industry. And I thought about you, Josh, uh, because what you evolve into is super interesting, mainly has to do with theme park and entertainment. Yeah. And um, Josh, just quickly before, if anybody doesn't recognize or know who you are, what you're doing, uh, and before I'll let you get into it, but uh, I just want to introduce you. You're an art production designer, set designer. You've been working with 20 years in the industry, television, theater, and themed entertainment. So you kind of touch a lot of different areas, even in user experience, design, and whatnot. So we're super happy to have you. Welcome. And you. if you want to just uh, sort of tell us a little bit about yourself a little bit more and sure. be like how you got to where you are now and what was your path and that kind of thing. Uh, the short answer to your question is I failed up. How's that? I failed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> To, uh, to be a designer, and I think that's part of, um, they tell you in art school that it takes usually, at least my art professor told me it would take me about 15 to 17 years to actually make something or have something come uh, to fruition, like to actually start from the ground up and then become a designer. I think that's very true. So uh, I have been doing this for about 20 years, a little more than that. Uh, I started Long story short, I, I started as an illustrator, um, got my undergrad degree in illustration uh, in Utah from Brigham Young University. And then from there, um, also started a curriculum emphasis at that school in entertainment design and theme park design. When it was very new, there wasn't a lot as far as education in the industry to study that type of emphasis or to have that emphasis. I think Art Center and Cal Arts were really the only schools that offered that type of emphasis. And um, for a person who grew up in Idaho uh, without a lot of silver spoons, so to speak, I hate that term, but really with not a lot of background support, um, I couldn't afford those schools. And so BYU was willing to let me kind of do my own thing and start my own emphasis and write my own curriculum loosely around what I loved and what I wanted to be. So from there, I moved to LA after a lot of tries and trying to get into the industry in the inner mountain West was not possible. And um, I've written some about this on, on blogs and different things, but uh, th it was right after September 11th, 2001, I was in school and no one was hiring designers or artists. And I think we can probably get back to that in this, in this discussion because it's kind of similar the environment we're in right now um i made stuff up meaning i knew what i wanted to be and i knew how i kind of knew how to do it um but i didn't know who to talk to and i i think i reached out and i was willing to learn from anyone in the industry that was willing to listen to me or answer an email or a phone call and um i was very humble about it really I, I i don't know what else to say other than i asked them yeah. to point me in the right direction and to teach me and i already had my degree but i was willing to listen and learn from experts in the field and so i moved to la i'm sorry i'm elaborating a little bit but i moved to los angeles and lived out of my car twice i literally lived out of my car and i ate food from the 7-eleven and i showered at the local gym and I was willing to like pound the pavement. I know a lot of other people who are diehard creatives, actors, directors, producers have this very similar story from 20, <laughs> 25 years ago, maybe not so now. Um, but back then I wanted it so that I could taste it and I was willing to meet the right people with the work and the portfolio to prove that I could do it, right? If they just give me a chance. And I wasn't the best, I was a terrible illustrator um, given the fact that I was new, I was a brand new young person doing it. Uh, 
But before I should say, before I left Utah, I was teaching high school. Somehow, well, that's a whole nother story, but I was working as a, a wilderness therapist because there were no jobs. There was nothing in the industry. No one was hiring designers. Uh, and I answered an ad uh, in the local student paper uh, to go work with teenagers in the desert. That was in 2003. Um, there's a whole, that's a whole nother podcast, to be honest with you. <laughs> I could talk at length about that and just about my own life and my own journey and my own experience, but, um, because it's come full circle yeah. in so many ways, but, um, I think I was hungry. I was really hungry and, and that's how it started. I get students and young people emailing me younger than me. <laughs> I try not to make myself sound too old, but, um, yeah. wondering how to work in the industry and they're like how do yeah. I be a theme park designer how do I go into entertainment design how do I work in TV and the answer for them always on my end number one do you draw yeah because I can learn and teach myself every digital program platform there is but if I can't draw and I don't have that basic skill none of that means anything to me because as a designer if you don't understand the basic parameters of illustration graphic design critique and taking critique in an art school like getting shredded in front of your peers by your professor i can't help you because there's a level of of teaching and education that comes with that that a lot of young people are not willing to go through these days because it's hard uh, and it's and it's humbling, very similar you know? in, in any art sphere i feel is interest generates passion and passion generates talent and talent generates success you have to go through that it's the same thing with totally. so many artistic sphere like uh, you know designing acting storytelling music uh, you just have to hold on to it and, and keep pushing forward yeah how do you find that those hard years moving out to LA has informed your overall approach to taking jobs or taking design jobs or anything like that? And any lessons learned that you're applying now during this time where so many people are out of work? Um, gosh, that's a really great question. Because... She's good at that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a deep question. Uh, and I have an answer. Um, I failed a yeah. lot. So having said that, in failure, sometimes you upset people you don't mean to. People call it burning bridges. I don't do that anymore. I try mm -hmm. really hard not to do that. Sometimes it's impossible because the industry is competitive and, and artists are sensitive people. And sometimes no matter how hard you try, it's not possible to please everybody. So I think some of the things I've learned is to quit trying to please everyone. There's only one person I'm trying to please now and it sounds selfish, but it's just truth and that's yeah. myself and making sure I'm the best version of who yeah. I can be, which I have not always been. So having said all of that, like uh, you learn, you learn uh, literally the only way to learn anything is by failing is falling flat on your face, at yeah. least for me. And as a designer, as an artist, you learn by your mistakes. Uh, like I've said, and I said at the top of, of the interview, I'm not the best illustrator out there but I'm a great idea guy. And I've got ideas that have made people a lot of money when they listen. And I don't expect everyone to listen, but when they do, it works. And, and the projects, or at least the projects I like to involve myself with now, um, I make sure that they're collaborative efforts. Um, I've learned also, there's no such thing as I and team. There is no I and team. I had to learn that the hard way. So by saying that, uh, I was not always, and I have not always been a supporter of that ideology. There was a time where I was cocky and arrogant and walked around snapping my fingers. There's times for that, but then there's also times to sit back and listen to everyone and go, you know, uh, there's nothing better than collab the collaborative process. And um, I should say, after all my education, illustration, um, and teaching high school, and working with kids as a desert survival therapist and all of that, uh, like I said, it's a whole nother story. Um, and then moving to LA and pounding the pavement and taking my portfolio, the hustle of being a designer is, is tangible, man. You can cut it with a knife. It is a hustle. I hustle today. It never ends. You're only as good as your last project, um, which is very true. It's an old Hollywood adage. It, it, there's nothing truer than that principle because um, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. And uh, I'm going to really date myself by saying this. Madonna in the 80s, reinvented herself 
all the time. Lady Gaga is just a reincarnation of Madonna. It repeats, right? So, um, and nothing to put any of those artists down because they're all really good yeah. at what they do. But that truth is, is consistent. You have to constantly figure out ways you can't rest on your laurels. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And you mentioned reinventing yourself. And I think now is probably sort of where everybody's at in terms of trying to figure out how do I reinvent myself? How do I make myself attractive to employers? How do I get on those, you know, jobs? And aside from that, even thinking about how taking what you already know and the lessons that you've learned and, you know, your skill sets and how is it even going to translate into uh, yeah. the future? And sort of what's happening now uh, after well, post pandemic when we get there. Okay, I have some definite thoughts on this. And Dom and I talk. We spoke earlier in the week about it, but um, and I didn't mean to cut you off. By the way, it's just no. Please go ahead. There, there was a meme online, and I think I found it on Facebook or Instagram or something on social media, and it was, it was to the extent of I'm an artist. I've already been in quarantine. <laughs> um, I've already been living this lifestyle. <laughs> Being an artist, one thing my old professors used to teach me and say all the time was being an artist is a selectively lonely lifestyle because you dedicate yourself to a craft that is highly competitive. There are people in the industry, like I've said, they're really good at what they do. And then there's everyone trying to be like them and copycatting those people. Um, people who are pioneers in their craft or what they do, you can't copy them because they're constantly swerving, right? Yeah, they go places, right? Oh, well, yeah, it's like, um, you can't you can't mimic someone who's constantly thinking ahead of you 10 steps. Yeah. So my invite to other people is don't be like them, be, uh, be yourself, be original, um, and your originality yeah. will come through. Okay, so having said that, um, the meme, going back to the meme, I, already have been working silently and quietly with my classical music playing in the background, uh, drawing, working to the wee hours of the night, sometimes 2, 3 a.m., um, honing my craft. Like I said, I was not always good. No one is ever right out the gates good, and it's not easy, and it's not fair to judge an artist or a designer right out of school. But you can tell by looking at someone's portfolio that they've got the chops. They'll make it work. The other part that I, that I look for as a designer or a person who hires a lot of young talent um, for my own projects is uh, uh, the, the willingness to, to listen and the willingness to work your butt off because that's what it takes. Quarantine and this environment uh, is really to me showing who's, who's willing to do those things because, and I'm not, this is not a blank statement for anybody and it, it's not meant to be interpreted that way. Um, I have a lot, we all have a lot of downtime. So what are you doing with your downtime? Now, I don't have kids. I don't have a family of my own. So I can't, I cannot make a blanket statement about like, if you're not writing a book right now and writing your bibliography or whatever, you know, your, your life story, then you're not working hard enough. That's just not true. Um, but for me it is because I've got time. So I, right now, I'll give you an example. I'm writing curriculum for an academy in Southern Utah, and it's all art therapy slash entertainment based. Um, I'm writing a book at the same time. <laughs> I'm working on an aquarium project here in Salt Lake that's really exciting, and they're doing some incredible things. And um, I'm collaborating with that creative team, the really interesting people that are smart about what they do. Um, I'm working with a company in Southern California that is fantastic with a team and we Zoom sometimes three times a day to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and uh, it's super collaborative because the ideas that we're passing around, everyone gives feedback and inputs on. And I gotta say, so to me, the modern designer, or at least the current designer, is someone that number one, doesn't need a brick and mortar space. I think that's a little old, um, antiquated as far as, I don't think it will ever really truly go away to some degree, but as someone who works freelance, I don't need a brick and mortar space to be able to create and draw and design. In fact, I don't like them because you end up sitting under this white electric light. They're not spaces for creative individuals. Yeah. 
and open office plans as awesome as that idea was 10 years ago it's not current anymore yeah you said it 10 years ago right it's not even relevant in a lot of ways it's not relevant and as an artist oh that's cool to sit in around and uh, draw in front of my peers and everyone walks around with their cups of coffee and looks at everyone else's work okay that's yeah. cool but i'm more productive in my own space absolute music and i can pull off the wall all the projects i'm working on and make sure that they all work and that i'm touching each one i agree them. with that and I, and i would also i would almost bridge it to you know artist and designer but i, I think it has to do with creativity uh, you know creativity yes. is a muscle and the more you do it the more it's available uh, and, and that's true for anybody who's trying to be innovative uh, you know and, and coming up with something new not just artists and and right. to that i would i would like to hear you on uh, you know your process of design thinking and and how are you going to approach this new sort of uh, post pandemic uh, how is it going to affect your your design thinking in thinking about uh, um, uh, a ride or an attraction or or a user experience space thinking about what might be needed um, a little bit like it was after September 11 where security was now embedded in almost everything we did now I feel like sanitation might be uh, something that we will have to deal with and especially with user experience space right yeah First of all, how do you put, so I'm used to designing things like walkthroughs and entertainment attractions that people are pulsed through. How do you accommodate smaller groups of people and still maintain your themed hourly capacity? How do you make money off, off how does a client make money off a, a smaller, maybe a smaller event? Um, it's, an, a, it's a fun challenge, actually. And if you look at it that way, like how do we accommodate this new thing, these new set of rules, right? First of all, I would like to say, and I think just by observation, how off the charts all the cable company, not cable, that's not the word. All the, the private acquiesced TV, what are they called, networks? I don't know what the new term is anymore. Yeah. We don't know anymore. <laughs> right. You've got CBS All Access. You've got Disney Plus. You've got Amazon. You've got Netflix. Um, and they're all looking for original content. Why? Because it's awesome. And because you can sit at home and watch these stories. It goes all the way back to the campfire. There's a campfire principle where you sit around a campfire and it's been happening for thousands of yeah. years. And um, the leader of the tribe or whomever tells this great story, it gets retold, it gets retold around the campfire, and the campfire was television, right? I mean, it's the early form of storytelling. So um, that idea, it's translating now, how you tell a better story and how you, how you tell more original creative content, right? That's like completely not like other things, maybe, that's something totally original. I think that's exciting. So that doesn't answer your question, Dom. I'm going on a segue. I'm sorry, but um, no, it's perfect because my my colleagues always makes fun of me when I when I bring this fire camp and this storytelling thing, and I tell them that storytelling is the most powerful tool, and they're like, "Oh, here's Dom with his stories again." It's fantastic to hear it from somebody else for once. I do want to throw something in the mix there, though, because a lot of the times, really, at the end of the day, you're telling stories and you're creating these experiences for companies who want to make money and have to make money off of whether the attractions or the rides that you're you're creating or the exhibits that you're putting up or whatnot. Right. And I think it was interesting what you were saying in terms of how do you do that on a small scale, but still help the company make that that dollar value, that ROI, get that ROI from that experience when they can have less people. Like yeah. I know Disney Shanghai, I mean, you did something with them and they're reopening their park as of May 11th, I think. Yeah, they just opened, yeah. Yeah, they just opened and uh, they had to do, I think 30% less people. So as opposed to 80,000 people a day, they're, they're opening with 24,000 people. So I saw a couple screenshots of the rides and people waiting in line and the stanchions and it was so spread out and so sparse. So 
it's really bizarre. And I think that that's where that whole idea of the, you know, creating the story, creating the experience, trying to help the company make that, uh, take advantage of that ROI, but yet not sacrificing that experience bizarre, right? for people. Because I thought it was really awkward to watch seeing people with so far in between stanchions and stuff, and they all had to wear masks, which is the norm, I guess. And they're taking pictures in front of, you know, Mickey Mouse with masks on. and. It kind of like hinders the experience a bit, even though we understand why it has to happen. How is that sort of affecting, like he was saying, the design thinking and going forward and not turn it into something where it becomes exclusive? Because small groups yeah. tend to be more on the exclusive side, which tends to be most likely will be more expensive. Right. So how do you, you know, get to the masses without creating that um, exclusivity um, right. and not uh, sacrificing the experience for the end user. I, I, I'm with you on guessing and I'm with you on thinking about it, right? Uh, my thoughts are this. I think the Disney company did something really, uh, kudos to them. They're always, they always hire the right people that help them move in a way that everyone else tries to follow, right? Let's just say that first of all, um, because their they're entertainment it, it goes, I'm going to say a few things, and that is family entertainment always makes money. When you make your entertainment or you sell your entertainment or you pertain your entertainment or market it to such a small margin, a group of individuals, you're you're not going to succeed. You're already failing because you're not, you're not marketing to a large, the largest group of people who can actually help you make money. So the Disney company does that really well. They always market to the family that's that's their niche and they own that niche they have for years right so they did something early on and that was they looked at netflix i believe i can't speak for them but they started disney plus they released something really interesting too they released their own programs which everyone else is doing too so it's not just them but they released something they already had corner of the market on and it blew up and then became the most watched show on television, The Mandalorian with Baby Yoda and all these things. I mean, talk about genius marketing and genius way of thinking, because I think that's going to be their number one moneymaker right now. I'm just using them as an example. TV, it used to be uh, Parks and Resorts was their bread and butter. And I, it's flipping because it's what you can do at home. So number one, it's family entertainment. Number two, I think it's how do you keep people entertained and you got to give them something to do. So uh, you always give them a track. You always give them a quest. You always give them the scavenger hunt. One thing about designing attractions and walkthroughs in events, the walkthrough is not enough. You have to give the people mm -hmm. or the guests something to find. A completion right? feeling, um, right? Like a... There has to be something, so video games do this really well. Um, board games, start with board games. You know, I grew up playing Pong and Mario Brothers, the Nintendo in 1988, 1989, even earlier. Pong was like 84, 85, an Atari system, right? And after playing that game for 20 minutes, you're like, okay, even though it was groundbreaking, like, okay, I got it, yeah. right? So how do you reinvent that wheel and make it more interesting and then everything has developed since then? I am by no means an expert in the video game world. I'm not at all. I love them, I appreciate them, um, and they're beautiful. And I literally play a video game just to look at the scenery. I just wander around, everyone kills me, and I die, and I just keep doing that. I have no desire to complete a level, to beat a boss, blah, blah, blah. Um, I literally play it to look at the space because I'm fascinated by the environment. So it's different for everyone, but I think if you always give people something to do, something to look for, you'll always make money. Um, I think then you set a new standard. How do you change the parameter? Is it, what's the next step? Is making it more interesting? How do you twist something that's maybe been done 80 times, but you turn your own, you put your own spin on it, make it kind of interesting. And then I think above all, and the most important part is how do you tell a really, a really good story? Uh, it goes back to the whole campfire yeah. principle. Good stories last so forever. And they're the same, by the way, it's the read Joseph Campbell. You read the hero's journey, all those things. Those ideas never change. All right. So then get back to your original question. How do you work that in theme parks? I think you need to look way in advance as how do you manage groups of people in a, in a smaller amounts and smaller numbers. 
Um, I think they've been doing it for years in Asia already. I lived in Asia for a long time. Uh, I've lived in Hong Kong, I lived in China, I lived in Singapore. They've been wearing masks and ha maintaining a sanitary style way before coronavirus ever came out. I know this, I was there. So if someone was, the mask by the way, wearing a mask is so you don't transmit it to anyone else. It doesn't prevent you from getting anything, right? Really, the science behind it isn't that. It's that in Japan, it's a, a, a form of respect so you don't make someone else sick if you've got something, right? Because it maintains it. So, I think the Western culture is having to um, adapt. They don't like the adapt. They don't like adapting, especially in the United States. It's very in when Dominic and I were talking about this. It's very individualistic form and sense of idea. Like it's all about self. Like I'm important. It's gotten even worse with social media in the last since 2007, since the iPhone was released. I think that was yeah, 2007. That was but I've watched social media and go into reality television and this idea that you are so important, that you need to be loved, you need to be hot. Yeah, all that's important, but what about the greater good? I mean, isn't that important? What about the common factor that we're all living on this rock floating through time and space, hurling around a giant burning ball of fire? That aren't we in this together it's to some degree? Like, so, I'm not answering your question. I'm just kind of pontificating about what I think is cool and what I think is important. No, know? but I, I think I hear you when you say that the, the ingredients are already there. The, the storytelling is powerful enough to bring this back. The immersive experience is powerful enough to bring this back. We just have to tweak and adapt. And already we have glimpse of that if we look at Asia and how they behave in such a way that they're more respectful of their surroundings. So we're, we're not too far from what I hear from you. Yeah, I don't think so seems like also we're saying that there's change like we need we're looking at changes um i mean of course with consumer behavior so that you know people being comfortable wearing masks like they are in asia versus north america and that kind of thing uh or europe and changes in design towards small spaces mm -hmm. right so there's a couple of factors that people are going to have to start considering you did mention something that i find interesting too though how disney you know markets the family how do you bring that experience home not to flip on the subject, but do you think that more and more we're going to see experiences really brought home via virtual reality, where originally that's kind of where it was going when VR, Oculus goggles were launched and all that kind of stuff, but it hasn't fully adapted, I find. It hasn't uh, hasn't hasn't been fully adapted at home. No, so a lot yet. of people kind of bought it. They thought it was kind of cool. They wanted to try it, but it's, it's, it's not like a go-to. It's still, it's still singular. Yeah, it's still very uh, singular experience, yes, but it's also still not uh, as widespread adapted as, as we see. Do you think that that's going to be a change in the way people are designing events, environments, experience, uh, and trying to use that technology? I think so. Uh, I will tell you that I don't know if you guys have done these VR walkthroughs. I did one um, two years ago, I actually walked through the void when they were um, with my buddy Ken Brettschneider and we walked through this system and it and uh, it blew my mind. <laughs> and it was just a test, it was a demo. Um, and then all of a sudden they launched their, their VR stuff and they were doing things with Star Wars and I did that and you're talking with your teammates on headpieces and you sound like you're stormtroopers and you're raiding the Death Star and things like that. And uh, I thought that was very team-based. Um, they need to, get, I felt that it could have been gamified, would have been so awesome. Like if you could see your point system on your mask or your eyewear and then everyone, I mean, it's that idea of like, how do you play the game with everyone else, right? Um, yeah. I think really fast too, to go back to an early question, the theme park industry, I think Disney and Universal Parks will always succeed because their parks are so well made and crafted and they have hired, you know, they've hired teams of artists, designers, engineers, architects um, that are challenged to create an environment that is awesome. And it's on this, in this reality, sphere of reality. That's, I think that's why I have always gravitated towards that because it's touchable. I can touch it. It's there. I can feel it. It's real. Uh, it's a fantasy brought to life. 
that to me is really exciting and it's also why in my own personal story I got a master's degree in set design because I wanted to be an expert at how do you design a set and not not be the guy that drafts it so much as being the guy that comes up with the idea and then makes it real and you know utilizes all the parameters to make something awesome um I think they'll always make money I think they're gonna be, I think all this is, it's, they're gonna have to adapt and I think we're all figuring that out. How do we adapt to all of this? But I think it's in the gamification. I think there's something with, even though, I mean, you're letting in units and groups of four to six people or whatever the standard is into a space. Okay, well then what else can you do with those people that are being pulsed, no matter how you like it, you have to pull them into an, uh, an attraction. There's something there. Um, I would also say, I think there's something there about how many people you have to let in the gate at one time. So those parameters, those challenges, I, I would hope, and I think are being met with open arms because this isn't going to change. I think this is the new wave of the new future to some degree. Uh, I think it will come and go. I think these things have in the last hundred more than that popped up and countries and civilizations have had to adapt to the operational standards of the way the world and life hands you. More from this interview after this short break. Maintain the aesthetic of your interior design by outfitting your entrances with a super sleek automatic hand sanitizing dispensing unit, complete with a temperature reader and a 21-inch LCD screen to communicate your marketing campaigns. This sophisticated unit allows your guests to safely access hand sanitizer while having their temperature read all while being shown your latest marketing messages. Connect to the built-in content manager through Wi-Fi so you can update messaging from any computer. Go to skylineentourage.com and visit our shop page for details or call 514-780-8810 to speak with a consultant today. I mean, it's not always a bowl of cherries, right? So I don't know, I'm kind of rambling. I'm just thinking out loud. Do you know, like, um, like what kind of conversations are you having with your colleagues or, or you know, fellow profession, pro- people in the industry about like the type of changes that you think are gonna come or that are gonna be new standards of design and that kind of thing, in particular for theme parks. I but so. I mean, I know you've touched so many different projects. I know you've been in film and funny yeah. enough, you were, I think I saw on your LinkedIn, you did, you were on the movie Contagion, which is kind of funny. <laughs> That's- True. <laughs> I did the event design for Contagion and then they asked me on a few from some of that, some other things about the production design and stuff like that. It was at the Lincoln Center in uh, New York City. Um, I, what I did, I felt like it was very small compared to what the rest of the team did, but I did work on that. And um, oddly enough, how long ago was that? That was in 2011, wasn't it? When that movie came out? I don't know when it came out, but I think around 2011, I think was. Yeah. Um, it's not the only film that kind of predicates some of this stuff. It's kind of scary, right? But um, Sorry, I digress there. I just, I threw that in because I thought it was really interesting to bit, but uh, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. to get back to it. Was, well, it's a scary movie, first of all. And the first part of the film takes place in Hong Kong with Gwyneth eating a Macau and getting sick. I've been to Macau and I got sick of Macau too. It was terrible. <laughs> um, not to digress, but yeah. Um, no, I just think that there's, look, I I don't believe that the brick and mortar space is, is uh, the best way to spend your money. I don't think the overhead is worth it when this stuff is going on. Um, I think the idea that Zoom is doing so well, using Zoom as we're speaking on the Zoom platform right now and other platforms, call-ins and big meetings, uh, is really interesting. I think it's awesome that it's being, I mean, what other choices do we have, right? Right. So I work out, I try and work out every day and I go to the gym and they're having to adapt parameters, how many people they're allowed in one space. They have to clean all the machines. You have to wear a mask when you work out, those things. Um, you know, the showers and the pools and all the big areas are shut down. Uh, restaurants, buffets are now kind of the way of the dodo. They don't exist anymore and they're closing, you know? So 
I just forgot your question. Do you think that people adapting to all of these different things, like you said, you're wearing a mask when you're going to the gym, which is very uncommon, unusual for people to do, and they're still grappling with even doing it, but they are. Um, do you think that theme parks or uh, event companies or just anybody in general, are we saying that, um, or is it correct to say that in order for people um, to make it worth it to put themselves through that, you know, go out, wear the mask and, and wait in those long lineups or maybe not so long anymore, but you have to sort of create an mm. above and beyond experience now. So it's almost like we're upping the ante now. So would that be a fair statement to say that companies like Disney and, and people like that will have to go even further to make it really attractive for people to even want to go out in those big crowds because even people's personal opinions have changed around big crowds and some people might not necessarily want to go fear changes people right uh, i grew up using myself and as, as example my own personal experience uh because i'm an artist and because i'm different anyways because i am an artist and it's interesting people uh, people's perspective of someone else. Like I always think that I have this perspective of who I am. It's everyone perceives things differently, right? So using that um, fear ideology is horrible. I hate it. And I grew up, I think being uh, looked at very differently. And so I have had that personal experience. The whole fear ideology just drives me crazy. Um, I don't know why I'm bringing that up other than going to using the gym and to your question, um, people are so scared. So the challenge I think is entertainment and uh, theme parks. How do you lessen the fear with still being in the parameters, of the CDC guidelines um, and doing it for the right reasons and not just to make a buck? Right. Maybe that's a marketing way. Maybe it's like we care. So here's a good example. Um, when you have a leader and a captain of the ship who doesn't care about the team, it's obvious. Because everyone goes, well, I don't feel like I care about at this place. Uh, they could care less about anything, you know. When it becomes so hyper-competitive and it becomes so computer-based, <laughs> Like, da, 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 da. then um, I don't care. I lose my interest because why would I care about the product I'm developing if they don't care about what I'm doing, right? So they're gonna have to somehow be a little bit real, I think, be a little bit more sincere and actually care for their customers and the people that they're trying to uh, appeal to. I think that's a huge thing. Uh, and corporate America doesn't usually do that. Using corporate Western stand standards, um, it's always about the money. I don't go for the project space. I mean, money's great. We all love money, but at the end of the day, and maybe I'm an idealist by saying this, I, I also pick projects and I, I do things that I'm passionate about, but also with teams and groups of people that I know I'm gonna like working with, companies I'm gonna like working for, companies that are a little bit more sincere, Companies that care for their people don't want to burn the people too, you know? So I think corporate America as a whole is going to have to like change their attitude. I don't know if that's even possible because so much of it is cutthroat Wolf of Wall Street thinking, which to me, I don't know. This thing, I think all this is going to change. Like when I say like brick and mortar spaces, a lot of people work at places because of the politics and they enjoy that. I hate that aspect. I'm not good at that aspect usually because I care about what yeah. I'm outputting. I think I think you touched on something too, though, about the companies having to change their output in terms of really showing that they care about their audience, which we already see is happening and they've had to. So when we look at brands who are succeeding throughout COVID, um, one of the major themes is really sort of uh, showing your empathy. Yeah. Uh, showing yeah. empathy for your user, your end user, your buyers and all that kind of thing. And so that's why we're seeing a lot of those commercials, you know, from the car companies will be here when you're, you know, we're here for you, Walmart's here for you, all that type of thing. Um, I think it's like a key ingredient right now when so many people are hurting. And I'm, I think you're touching on something in terms of when you're designing or when we're looking at events and creating experiences, how are we sort of relaying that uh, we care about you? 
throughout all of these regulations and things that we have to put in place in order to even open doors. And these are the type of conversations, like how, how has these changes informed even the, the projects that you're working on now? Like you said, you were working on a few projects here and there with Zoom and whatnot. What kind of conversations have you guys have been having around these pandemics, if it affects it at all? First of all, I have to say that one of the companies I'm working with and my buddy Mal, who I respect a lot, it's obvious that they care about their team. It translates even through the Zoom calls. Uh, and I think part of that is because it's super collaborative and everyone's giving out ideas and it's fun and it's exciting. Maybe it helps that I'm not in a brick and mortar space doing that, that it is via this type of communication. So that probably helps. Maybe that's a filter that I'm getting and I'm getting the information through myself. But like I said, I don't, I get offers, I get projects. I didn't used to. I used, there was a time where, and going back to my previous story about my life where I was a starving artist and it truly was, I was a starving artist. And now I get to pick and choose what projects I want, which is amazing. It only took 22 years, yeah. 23 years. <laughs> I've been on my car twice, but, um, Nowadays, I get to pick. So if I get to pick, I'm not going to work for someone yeah. who's going to treat me like I think crap. that's what I hear. I just don't want to do that. Life is short. Drink out of a fire hose. Like, I use that analogy all the time. Um, life is very short. And I know that personally from personal experience. So um, why not take advantage of every opportunity you have? That's a positive, good benefit. That kind of opportunity. Yeah. Um, I'm never answer. I'm not answering any of your questions. No, but what what I hear though is that uh, not only we'll have to focus from the big buck to the human factor, but the human factor as a client, but also the human factor as employee and producers. You know, so the way you make things and who you address yourself to will have to change. Um, you know, to a more human. So, can you talk at all about the projects that you're working on right now, or is it kind of under wraps? I've signed NDAs. I can tell you about my personal projects. Um, just with uh, with the aquarium here in Salt Lake, it's, it's an expansion and it's really cool. And they're doing really cool, innovative things. And they're having to think outside the box to appeal to w exactly what we're talking about. How do we bring groups of people in? How do we do it the right way and let them know that we care about them, that they are safe? Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to Loveland. I'm going to give a total shout out to Loveland Living Planet Aquarium because they think they're awesome. They're actually trying to appeal to families and go, look, we want you to be here uh, because we care. And the animals, the animals care to a degree, right? They're animals, right? So yep. um, they have feelings. And I think part of all that, I don't know. I don't want to say anything I'm not supposed to say, but um, I think being sensitive and empathetic empathetic is awesome and you know it's it's easy not to be it's easy to get lost in your own world and i think businesses um that aren't empathetic it's obvious i think this whole thing with the celebrity i don't know if you've read all these articles about celebrities online drinking their margarita or whatever it is in their swimming pool and there's this guy that was making fun of them online it was really funny but um with Jennifer Lopez and stuff like that, and her giant house with her beautiful husband or boyfriend, whatever he is, and all her beautiful kids, and this gorgeous pool with palm trees swaying in the breeze, and you're like, I can't relate to that. So it mm. becomes like the celebrity worship that they're, I mean, this is a whole nother topic, but uh, I can't relate to those people because I don't live that life. So you're having to, there. I would challenge a lot of those people in that industry to start relooking at how they present themselves because, and maybe this is the wrong thing to say, so I apologize in advance, but I can't relate to <laughs> someone drinking champagne on an airplane when it's a giant and they're filming it, when the world's going to heck in a handbasket and everyone's freaking out. Like, I I just think that's really poor taste, um, you know? Yeah. Um, it's So it's those adages like, how do you market that? How how do companies market themselves as being empathetic when I think this is showing some of those companies are disappearing because they haven't been very empathetic. Retail, there's a lot of retail where it's like, dude, we just need to sell clothes. So just get here, work your 14 hour shift, we'll pay you nine bucks an hour and sell, sell, sell. That's not empathetic. That, uh, yeah, that's gonna be make <laughs> or break probably for a lot of companies that act and try to continue acting this way, I feel. 
Uh, yeah, and I think it's happening right now. And I, I don't know. I don't know those companies. I'm just, and, and it's a very broad opinion and generalization, yeah. but I would think that that's like, there's got to be a better way to do those things. And there's got to be a better way for them to survive. Um, and I think this is a huge lesson for all of them. Absolutely. I think you also, um, I want to just touch on something because you were saying, we, we were talking about company selling and being able to do that. A big portion, obviously, of our business and what we do is in trade shows. And I know you were working at uh, Victory Hill Expositions, if I'm not mistaken. Long yeah, long and you had a project with Hasbro and I saw some of the images online. It looked really incredible. Um, just to switch gears to trade shows in that sales environment. Um, kudos, let me just say, I have to give the team kudos. So being uh, Nick Cooper, Richard Sears, Ken, Nguyen, the rest of the group, um, because they worked their butts off. Um, and really it was Nick and Richard just killing it. So just <laughs> <No problem>. <laughs> <laughs> I did work there. I'm lucky and happy that I can say that I worked with those guys because they were really cool. Um, and we were doing stuff with the Avengers and Marvel product that was really awesome. Um, and Hasbro, yes. So former based walkthrough attraction and stuff like that. And so your experience uh, in doing that, and if we just translate that to trade shows, so trade shows is really just about not just, but one major uh, component is creating that experience in your booth space for your target audience, connecting with those, with your, with your, you know, key contacts. Um, what do you think is going to be a change in the way uh, people are going to be thinking of designing exhibits for post pandemic, post COVID, or even like the walkthroughs or things that you guys have done? Well, right now the conversation, this goes back to what we were saying earlier, I think is how do you pulse groups of people the right way? Um, is it, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but is it lottery style? Do you allow so many people, they win some kind of a golden ticket, they get to go? Um, is it about patiently waiting? Which Americans are terrible at. They hate to wait. Yeah. They want everything now, you know? Um, so uh, how do you bring that to people where uh, they can't go to it? I think that's the challenge. So I think if you look at that question, how do you bring something really cool to people that they can enjoy? I think there's something really genius about food trucks. <laughs> uh, and they, this is not by any means the answer for event spaces or giant conventions, but- I think they're both the people, yeah. I'm in Utah and I got to tell you, there's all these little young guys that graduate from business school in Utah County uh, and it's famous for this and they figure out ways to sell food because people in Utah like to eat. <laughs> so uh, there's Waffle Love, J Dogs. I mean, you can go down all these lists of these fast food companies that toot around in little trucks. I, I think that's a pretty genius way to make money and I, I think that's they by no means did they start that trend but they're doing it right now you know they're parking food trucks in the walmart parking lot because even though walmart has had using them as an example right they're under they have covid restrictions but everyone's going there right uh same with costco you got you can't go into costco without wearing a mask now i mean that's the requirement right so is that going to prevent people from going to costco in this environment no you still have to buy food. So in other words, I think you have to look at what's necessary. What's the necessary thing? Um, what is it necessary anymore? It's the same thing that I think actors are going to have to are looking at how they, how they market themselves. Um, you have to answer the hard questions. And I think the hard questions sometimes don't have answers. You have to figure out a way to answer it. Right? So back to basics. Yeah. I'm not answering any of them. I'm <laughs> just talking around them, but um, you get it. But it is interesting how you're, uh, that you pointed out in terms of um, what is necessary and what is not. And you can even sort of echo that in any event, like what's necessary, what's not to create an experience and how can we maybe bring that experience or uh, you know that entertainment to people 
you know, whether it's restaurants, you know, via food trucks or, you know, virtual reality at home or online or whatnot. So I think uh, I think that aspect of things is kind of interesting. We've talked about it a little bit, you know, throughout the, our conversation in terms of bringing the experience to people, you know, uh, making that experience overall uh, an incredible one so that there's still that validation and then finding interesting ways of getting uh, creating it also for small groups. I had a really interesting thought when you were talking and I just forgot it. Oh. <laughs> but yes, totally agree with you. It's a challenge and I think it's going to moderate and just going to, oh, here's the thought. I just remembered World War II, Great Depression. Let's look at the history, right? People, and I was just listening to a podcast last night, how much modern are people in modern times being now, this current group of people on this planet, how they hate history. Uh, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. They want to ignore it. They want to pretend it didn't happen. Why? Because it's painful. History, the past, is not always embraced. No matter if it happened or not. Right. Uh, and I would say humans, just as a general broad statement, um, are always trying to do new stuff, get new things, consume, buy, purchase. But if you look at the Great Depression, what was making a lot of money in the Great Depression? Well, there was no money. My grandmother used to talk about how she saved her nickels and a nickel was like 10 bucks. I mean, it was seen like that the value was so polarized, so different, right? No one had money. And people who had money were losing money. They were becoming homeless on Wall Street in New York City. There's photos of these guys selling apples and they were top-notch business guys that were worth millions of dollars in 1928, 1929, 1930, whatever. What made money? Movies made money. Entertainment. Uh, so I think we have to look at like how does that entertainment, how does it still make money, but how do we follow the, I don't know. It's it's the same conversation we keep having, but I think there's something there. You could study that model. How in the world did Snow White and Seven Dwarfs make almost $38 million in 1939? And it cost a nickel to go see the movie? I, I use that only because I did my research and working for the Disney company, but it, it, when you take traditions courses to be a cast member in the Disney parks, of which I've been a cast member twice, 25 years ago, they teach you in traditions courses, modernized traditions courses, that story. It was a nickel and you got a bag of popcorn and a Coca-Cola and you got to see the movie and it still made all this money. It made incredible amounts of money. And uh, I think there's a huge model there. Like, uh, look at the past. How do we learn from the past? And how do we learn from what happened anyways? Like yellow fever in Philadelphia wiped out half the city, right? or the Spanish influenza in 1918. My great, great granddad died of the Spanish flu. He was an engineer on, on Union Pacific. So those things are there, they're there. We just have to look them up. We have to study them. We have to embrace the fact that yeah. it teaches something and we are better because of it. Right, right. So. No, I think that's a great point. And um, unfortunately I find during, well, by circumstance as well, during pandemics and things, we sort of only learn afterwards. You know, I have seen a lot of sort of content coming out about what we can learn now, people trying to, you know, figure out what are the lessons learned already, but I think it's a great point in terms of just uh, nodding towards the past and seeing what, what can we do that will A, influence the way we market or influence the way we interact with people or even influence design in the future. But uh, you've had so many different industries, you know, television, film, the whole theme parks. You worked with Disney and exhibits. Can you just tell me sort of what's your favorite project you've ever worked on? That's a hard question. I would say, <laughs> oh gosh, give me a second. Yeah, okay, I have an easy answer now. All of a sudden this came to me. I worked on a, a park called Evermore Park. And the very first six months of working on that project was incredible, mostly because no one told me no. <laughs> and it was like, go, go, go. Um, right. And I would say that my team and the team I got to work with, we just dove in head first. And I think the proof's in the pudding. All you got to do is go look at the scenery, look at the sets, 
because it's and I it's not just be, it's it's because of the entire team because there was a, I was able to hire young people who had never done this sort of thing before and they sunk their teeth into it because they because I think I hope because they saw the conveyance of care and because we had an end goal in mind and a very short time frame, um, so I would say um, opening that park was a, was a great experience, and it's still alive, still surviving, which is great for them. I think it's good to see that. I would also say I think when you work on big projects with a lot of people who care a lot and are passionate about something, it either brings out the best or brings out the worst in people and people do weird stuff. So, um, and I've learned that myself. Um, I would say Disney Shanghai was an incredible experience. I failed miserably. If I had to be so honest, I think I had a lot of scope and it was a lot of work and I failed up learning through it, both personally and professionally, things I never wish to repeat. And I've been honest about that on other podcasts and stuff before. I like to own my faults. I don't like other people owning them for me, you know? You have full control, like uh, full creative control on your projects? Now I pick projects where I get to call the shots because I have all this history, background, experience. I go, no, that's good. <laughs> Unless it's for the big team and I'm reporting to someone else, which is still very much the case in a lot of things. but. I have a very strong opinion on what is visually and aesthetically awesome. Uh, and I, and um, you can get challenged with those things, but ultimately I think I put up a pretty good fight with what works and why it is interesting. Um, I would also say my theater projects, uh, last year I got to do Mama Mia with the Sundance Mountain Resort. Um, which sold out and was off the charts and was an incredible team of collaborative artists. Um, you know, they say in theater that well, theater is the true collaborative art form. Yes and no, I would say the designers are very truly collaborative because they have to be. The, the directors and the producers still get to call the shots and say, no, I don't like that, right? But um, mm. costume designers, lighting designers, set designers have to really collaborate, tell the visual story the right way. It's a lot of work and they don't get a lot of credit. Um, and so I've had to like draw myself back a little bit, quit fighting for, for that theatrical credit because that's the world I'm used to. Um, you know, because you're designing for actors and actors just always want the credit no matter what, no matter how you dice it. I know I have a degree in acting, so I can say that. And I think I have some credence there. But uh, yeah, theater, I got to do Sweeney Todd at UVU with a Broadway director, a Broadway cast, and a Broadway budget, which was incredibly off the charts. It was beautiful. Um, it was a great show. It's one of my favorite shows. I'm finally getting to do things that uh, that I always wanted to do. But like I said, it's because it's finally coming to me. So just, I think it goes back to what I started saying earlier in, in our conversation was um, the hustle is very real and you earn, it's like being in the Marines, the army or the armed forces of some, so you earn these patches, right? Oh, it, and it's proverbial, it's not real, but symbolically, yeah, I, dude, I've been in the trenches. You're down there and you're like, no, I'm building this thing. And you have a right to own that. No one can take that from you. It's hard. You're covered in dirt. You're sleeping, you know, four hours a night under your desk, um, sometimes no sleep. And, you know, not everyone gets that experience. And so you care, really care about what you're building and you care about what you're designing. And um, I think if you care, it shows in the product, the end result, right? Yeah, for sure. You did mention that you often are met with resistance towards sort of whenever you're designing, you know, something, an experience or whatnot for an audience, and it's met with the resistance. What are your main criteria uh, to convey your vision, number one? And how do you kind of overcome that, that resistance? Well, let me just say, um, and maybe this goes against what I said, there's an old saying, you know, uh, you gotta cut your babies, which is not literal. <laughs> but it's an art school saying because, um, I'll, I'll tell a little mini story if you don't mind, maybe hopefully answer your question and then tell you how I've done it both the bad way and the good way. So just to show that I'm human, <laughs> they make a lot of mistakes, but, um, 
I, in art school, I had this professor who was this incredible illustrator. His name was Leon Parsley. He just graduated, or he graduated, he just retired. The guy taught thousands of students in junior college, and um, he probably won't like that I'm telling the story, but he's a really good guy. Anyway, there was this girl that sat next to me in basic drawing 101. It was the hardest class I've ever had in my entire life, just so you know. I was like, basic drawing, oh, this is gonna be a piece of cake, right? So first day of class, there's 120 kids in this course in this private junior school um, and with a fantastic art program, by the way. And uh, this is a long time ago. So he he quit doing this, but he did this when I was there in 1995. So um, very first day of class, he talks about the grading scale and, and everything you'd be learning, everything, all your assignments. And he began the course in chalk on the chalkboard, which also shows my age, but by drawing a giant F. He says, if, if you think you're the best artist on the planet and you think you deserve the A and you think because your mother and your grandma hung your drawings on the fridge and praised you every day, this is what I'm going to give you. And he drew a giant F. Well, he went all the way up the grading scale and then he drew this tiny A. It was like this big. And he goes, this award, and he circled it, is given to the people who show they've got talent, but they put in the effort. In other words, the only people that survive in this industry, the 1% of artists, artists, drawers, illustrators, because it's different. That term artist, I'm talking about those people because it's harder. It's guarantee you harder than a lot of other terminology as far as art is concerned. But he said, if you want to be that person who makes money off being an illustrator or being a creator, you have to dedicate yourself to that idea. Meaning, the 1% that succeeds lives, eats, drinks, and breathes this. Maybe you'll have a life. And as hard as that sounds, as hard as it was, he was so right on the money. So part of that other story is this young lady was sitting next to me in that course. The very first assignment he gave us was a construction drawing. So he told us to go home, find something man-made, like a vacuum, a handy vac, an electric screwdriver, a drill, a power drill, and draw it like it was made of cellophane or plastic. So you can see all the pieces. So he said, go home, take the drill apart. I want to see all the nuts, the bolts. I want to see the gears. I want to see how that thing operates. I want you to draw it in there. And he showed examples, these beautiful drawings of it in two-point perspective with all the pieces, all the lines. We couldn't use erasers and we couldn't use rulers. We had to use a number two Ticonderoga pencil and put it on this 18 by 24 plate piece of paper. And then he told us not to sign the art. He said, just bring in the art pin the cork board for critique in four days. So this is four days. He said, if you do not spend a minimum 30 hours on this assignment, you don't get a grade. And so we're all like, holy cow, I don't know how to do this. I spent all weekend on this thing, this drawing, like seriously. My roommate was going on dates, we'd come home, I'd still be drawing, working on this thing, practice. And I went through like 20 sheets, practicing to get this um, drawing right. When it came time for critique, it was a Monday morning at 8 a.m. and I had maybe five hours of sleep all weekend. I came in, pinned my drawing on the board with everyone else. By the way, there were 120 kids. There were now only 10 kids in the class. Everyone had dropped. <laughs> everyone had dropped the course because they realized it wasn't about being crafty. Nothing against that. It wasn't about doing this for funsies. This is about learning how to do it to make it a craft, right? To be the best of the best. So this is an analogy. I'm telling a big analogy story. <laughs> well, we hung in the drawings up and this girl sitting next to me named, I think her name was Denise. I'm trying to remember. You could tell of all the drawings. So this is what it's like being a, an artist in a critique. Everyone's looking at all the drawings on the board and everyone's breaking them apart. And analyzing, you're comparing your work to everyone else's. By the way, a lot of corporate jobs too, when you work in a brick and mortar space are no different, right? So all the drawings are hanging on this on this board and we're all just like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. I mean, not everyone gets this experience in life, right? To be ripped and shredded apart unless you go on some cooking show on you know, a network program, right? Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> yeah, but I love that guy for this very reason. So 
Leon comes in, he doesn't say a word, his hands are behind his back, and he's this little tiny guy, and he's looking at all the drawings, and he takes off this big pointer staff, and he goes, and he whacks the board, and he goes, Josh, Stedman, this is yours, right? I'm all, how does he know? I didn't sign the drawing. He goes, I can tell by the pencil work, and la, 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 la. He analyzed, the guy was an expert. He had worked with thousands of kids up to this point. This is 1995, and he's like, uh, and you did this and you did this and then this looks like your personality. I'm going to say that that's you. Am I right? And I'm all, yeah, that's mine. And he critiqued me. Well, he got to this, this young lady sitting next to me and he goes, Denise, are you engaged? She's like, what? He's like, do you have a boyfriend? She's like, yes. He goes, did you go to a school dance this weekend? Because it was like, some kind of big school dance, college dance. She goes, how did you know? He goes, because you only put 10 hours into your drawing. And she just melted and she's sitting there. She goes, you're right, I did it. And he ripped the drawing off the board and he walked right, now I would say it, by today's standards, you probably can do this, but this lesson was huge for me. He took it, he folded it up and he ripped it into four corners and he put it on her desk and goes, redemption's real. You can go home and you're going to redo this drawing and I'm going to give you the grade. But I'm not giving you the grade for that. You're worth more than that. You're better than this. Okay, this is 1995. By today's standards, you can't do that. But in 1995, you could do that. And um, that girl ended up going to Art Center on a, on a full ride scholarship or something like that. She then became an amazing graphic designer. And now she owns a firm, or she did the last I'd heard about her, and became a millionaire because she was designing and inventing fonts and owned this state-of-the-art award-winning graphics annual based firm. I heard her speak, and she told that same story about how it made her who she was. So I forget why I'm telling you the story other than as an artist, as a designer, the hard stuff, hitting the mileage, meaning the 10, the 15 mile mark, the 20 mile mark, 25 mile mark, 30 mile mark. You don't go from five miles to 60 miles an hour without hitting all those marks. <laughs> and it's hard and it's painful. Um, but those awards that you wear on your chest, those little banners, badges of honor, um, it's because you earned it, because it took effort and it took hard work and it took pain and agony and failure and feeling like a loser and looking like a loser in front of people you care about, you know? To wrap it all up, just about the quarantine thing, I think we have to reanalyze to bring this all together. Uh, we have to reanalyze how we treat each other. I think we have to reanalyze how we think about design and art, how we make it. And, and care about the craft, but we do it in a way that's empathetic. We do it in a way that's about a team effort and a group. We think about the collective, not just the individual. And by the way, all this is stuff I'm saying that's a challenge for me too. I mean, it's a challenge for everyone. How do we do it the right way? How do we do it the best way without turning people away, turning them off, making them upset? I mean, all those things are still things too. I think that's a really good uh, wrap up uh you kind of actually just summed yeah. up sort of everything we've been talking about uh but i think so yeah absolutely i think it speaks to it yeah like uh focusing on the human level focusing on not just making a big buck focusing on empathy and how you do things rather than the end result uh, will be a significant key into uh going through this situation i strongly believe yeah yeah definitely from the designer perspective too it's been interesting trying to you know understand uh, what are going to be those touch points that people are going to have to meet or those markers or standards in order to do good design yeah the design has to accommodate us and we have to accommodate and move with it so you have to be fluid yeah. right yeah one of my favorite quotes ever by a man named black elk and there's a book out there yeah. called black uh black elk speaks i think that's the name of the book he was the last, last living tribesman, holy man of the Lakota tribe. He said, bend like a sapling in the wind. <laughs> it's a great adage and it's and it's not, I've heard it in, in um, the Dao De Ching. There's some of that there too. Um, Confucius used to teach some of this too. 
but it's um it's don't be so stoic that you don't change you have to be malleable because change is inevitable it's always going to be there you have to embrace it and go you're my friend even though sometimes i hate your guts right especially in this time i mean that's exactly what it is i'm super happy to uh, to have spoken to you josh this has been fantastic yeah thanks for having me guys hopefully anything i said makes any sense whatsoever absolutely but... it did it did make sense no it was definitely a very good insights so i appreciate your time and thanks for joining us no thanks to you guys Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Tune in weekly for new interviews and head over to our website for more episodes. While you're there, be sure to head over to our COVID-19 business solutions page to see what we've been up to. Because what does an event company do when there are no events happening? Well, we've turned our attention to support our clients and other businesses in getting back to work safely. That's why our designers have customized our lineup of products to improve your space and more importantly, allow for safe distancing without compromising looks. We're also really excited to introduce a new lineup of UVC lights that disinfect any space safely in minutes and kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses, including COVID-19. So don't forget to head over to our website at skylineentourage.com for more details on how we can help you. That's skylineentourage.com.